Welcome everyone to Give God 90, Radio On Demand. I call it Radio On Demand because you are in control of when, where, and how you listen to this program. You know, when you download the Give God 90 app, it puts you in control. And for all the new listeners, let me uh, tell you that it is an absolutely free app for your Apple or Android device. You get to choose when, where, and how you listen to this program. Or not listen to it, as the case may be. So, you you know, that's why you're in control. That's why it's on demand. You get to choose. And I like uh, having that freedom for you out there. Now, on Thursday nights, we do a live broadcast, uh, and that is also in conjunction with a Facebook Live uh, promotion, not promotion, but a broadcast that we do. And I don't get into the depth and detail on Thursdays that I do on Mondays when I release these pre-recorded programs, um, just because I like to keep that a little bit lighter, uh, airier. I try not to get into anything really, really heavy, and it gives me the opportunity to interact with uh, some of our listeners who comment on either Spreaker or on Facebook. So that gives me that opportunity, and I really enjoy doing that. It's getting to be a lot of fun uh, on Thursday night. Today, something very special. We are, uh, as I record this, okay, uh, entering into what's known as the 10 days of awe. And if you listened uh, to my last uh, podcast, you'll notice that I, I put it out there, should Christians observe and celebrate these Jewish holy days, and if you listen to that, what you learned very quickly is that they're not Jewish holy days. They belong to the Creator. He never relinquishes ownership of them. Uh, now, the Jewish folks, they have named these ten days between uh, the beginning of the seventh month and Yom Kippur. Uh, they, they've named it the ten days of awe. And it really is kind of an awesome time because when you think about it, so much is going on. We, we enter this period of time when we really kind of get serious about repentance. We get really, really serious and solemn about, have we messed up? How bad have we messed up? Now, I know that the majority of the folks I speak to are Christian. I do have quite a few uh, Jewish friends who listen to this. Uh, some of them faithfully, some of them uh, when they can. But here's the thing. Christians understand things differently than my Jewish listeners. You see, Christians say, well, I can repent anytime I want to. Well, you know what? So can my Jewish listeners. But it's this particular time of year when we're getting ready to be forgiven, not individually, but as a group of people. And that's a difference. That's, that's the difference. When we think about as an entire group, and we are bound together not just by uh, national borders, okay? It, it's not a country we live in. We who have chosen the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you can, you can choose however you want to describe this as being grafted in or being adopted. Paul uses both of those uh, concepts, okay? But when you choose to join that group, you're actually joining a family. You see, the Almighty says... He's going to put your name, or I'm sorry, he's going to put his name on you. <clears throat> so when you choose the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you join a family. And, and what's actually happening is he is going to choose, or he chooses at this time of year, I should say, not to just forgive individually. Because he does that all the time. Now he's willing to collectively forgive. And although what I'm going to talk about today is not forgiveness, what I'm going to talk about today is hope. 
we need to remember that that collective forgiveness is what gives us what many people consider to be hope. Okay? Now, if you look, and I reference King James Version often because it's probably uh, the version that has the most reference material to to accompany it, including the Strong's uh, Concordance. If you look up hope in the King James Bible, you're going to find it 133 times. But that is not a really good figure to go on. Okay? That's really not a, a good figure to go on. Now, for my Christian listeners, if you look up hope in the New Testament, you're going to find that it is the Greek word elpizo. It's Strong's number 1679. And it simply means to hope or expect. And the last part of that definition is trust. Okay? Now, this Greek concept of hope or expectation, um, I, I don't want to downplay it at all. But what in, in America we have come to think of it as and in much of the English speaking world hope is one of those things where um, it, it's not taken as seriously as some other things you know uh, a, a child may hope he gets a new toy for his birthday his or her birthday a working adult may hope they receive a paycheck when the day comes for them to get paid. Um, you know, other other times, you know, I hope I get a good test result if I go to a doctor. I hope I receive something. See, hope is always um, an expectation of you receiving something. All right? That is hope. We're looking at hope in this this way, um, and, and that's what we've been taught. That's what we've been trained to do. But is that a good definition? Is it a good example? Is it a good um, is it a good way of thinking? Is it really a good way of thinking? You know, if, if I hope for something, should I just naturally expect to receive it let's dig into this a little bit more let's look into the bible a little deeper let's go back let's go back and we're going to look at hope in what christians commonly call the old testament if you look at hope way back when you're going to find the Hebrew word is tikva. It's Strong's number 8615 in the Hebrew. But the definition, you're not going to recognize. Because the definition of tikva is cord or line. Now, how in the world can we expect to see a cord or a line equal something that we should define as hope? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, wait a minute. Remember, there's a wide gap sometimes between Hebraic thinking and ancient Hebraic thinking especially and Greek thinking. If we look in Joshua chapter 2, we see uh, you know, they tell Rahab, you know, when we come back we hope to see this scarlet thread hanging from your window, right? But that's not what it says in Hebrew. That is the uh, wording, sort of. But the way it is, it's, you know, we cord thread the window, the scarlet color in this window. And what they're, what they're doing is... They're, they're com- emphasizing 
an expectation. It's not something that they expect to receive. It's something they expect to see. It's something they expect to happen. It's something they have a desire, a strong desire for. You see, the the ancient Hebrew people, their concept of hope was much different than what our concept of hope is today. Our concept of hope today, as I've said, is we expect to receive something. But the ancient people, they trusted their creator Not always so that they would receive something, but he would deliver his promises. If he promised to take care of them, they trusted him enough to do it. Think about this. Ezekiel. Ezekiel was one of the the prophets who often was faced with the angriest portrayal of our Creator. If you read Ezekiel properly, you're going to get this feeling that God was so mad. He's just continually pointing His finger in Ezekiel's face and screaming at him. Just literally screaming at him. He never calls Ezekiel by name. It's always, hey you! Hey, you! But he showed Ezekiel something. He showed Ezekiel a valley of dry bones, and he said, speak. And Ezekiel spoke, and something happened. Ezekiel trusted enough to open his mouth and speak. In Isaiah 26... We have a promise from our Creator. The promise, and I'm not going to read the entire verse. Because I encourage you to go read this in context. In Isaiah 26, verse 19, it begins, Your dead shall live. Christians today have hope of resurrection. The ancient Hebrew people had an expectation that God would deliver his promises. You see that word tikva that's defined as cord or thread sometimes, maybe line, is often translated as hope or expectation Longing or desire, depending on the translation. It ties things together. It binds, it binds action and reaction. It binds if we do the things we should be doing, then our Creator will do the things He's promised us to do. Specifically, this time of year, as we get ready for Yom Kippur, what do we see? Well, on Yom Kippur, we have, you know, the two goats, right? And the scarlet thread. And people get hung up on the idea of the sacrifices. People get hung up on the idea of uh, of all the blood. You know what? People today also get hung up on this concept sometimes. Uh, and, the, and the common phrase for this is throwing out the fleece. You know, like Gideon did. He, he laid the fleece on the, on the floor. And he says, you know, let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. Or let the, the ground be dry and the fleece be wet. He wanted to make sure that what he was hearing was in line with what he wanted, Really? He, he, he didn't want his desires to be put ahead of God's will. Today, I don't know how many times I have heard people say, I just need a sign. I'm looking for a sign. 
For some people, it's a butterfly. For some other people, you know, it might be uh, a child playing with a ball in a field. For other people, uh, it might be a little more in depth than that. But they, what they want to see is some some physical thing that the Almighty's working in their life. Ladies and gentlemen, the goats were the physical sign for the ancient Hebrews. When they turned those goats loose, they understood, well, when they turned the one goat loose and the other goat ran away, when they, when they did this, they trusted that their creator would actually do what he promised he would do. And for a very long time, that scarlet ribbon that they hung turned white. It was something they could see. It was something they could talk about. It was something that they could spread around and say, we watched this happen. We know we're forgiven because we saw that happen. Now, the last time that happened, happened to be, yeah, I said that right. The last time that scarlet ribbon turned white was the year Yeshua was crucified. And you really, it's talked about in the Talmud. It's not talked about in Scripture, but it is referenced in the Talmud. That's how we know what year the temple was actually destroyed. It wasn't 70 A.D. Now, you think that's hope or is that trust? That for all those many years, every time they saw something that they could look at, witness, talk about, and know was real. That that covering at Yom Kippur, which really means day of covering, that actually was their sign. And I, I don't want to say it was a sign of their time, but it kind of was. Today, we, we see th- different things. You know, today we sometimes talk about blind faith, and I really don't like that term because we are told in Scripture that faith is the evidence of things not seen. Now, sometimes that evidence, you know, you can't see air, but you can feel it moving. That's evidence of something you can't see. Now, I know in certain parts of the world you can see the air, or actually you see the particulates that are floating in the air. But you feel the effect. It's evidence of something you can't see. Back then, the evidence of their forgiveness was that red ribbon turning white. The evidence of their forgiveness as a family, as a nation, as a collective group of people, was what happened. Our evidence today is not so much as a nation, because we're so spread out and varied. Believers live in every nation on every continent. They're connected by their faith. They're connected by their hope. They're connected by their trust. But even today, as we go through... Now, a lot of times, I have to, I have to caution people. When you are in these ten days of awe, and you're, and you're really in that mode and mood of repentance the thing you have to keep reminding yourself of is you can expect the almighty to keep his promise you can expect to receive the things he's promised to give you 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 know it's not i hope i'm going through this and and god's going to give me something You should trust, if you follow his instructions, he will keep his promise. There's a difference there, isn't there? That difference, 
that exciting difference is you don't have to, oh, I hope. Because the difference is, I know if I do this, he will do that. I know if I am faithful, he will keep his promise. John chapter 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. John doesn't pull that out of thin air. Okay? John gets that from somewhere very specific. John reaches all the way back to Leviticus. Chapter 26, down in verse 40, it says, If they confess their iniquity, if they confess their lawlessness, in other words, and that of their fathers in their treachery they committed against me, and how they walked contrary to me, in return I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies. And he goes down further with this, and he says, When they do these things, I will forgive them. That's what... Uh, this time of repentance in the 10 days of awe is all about. It is about forgiveness. But it's also about more than hope. It's about expecting the Almighty to do the things He says He's going to do. And, you know, one of the things that you might not know is the Israeli National Anthem. The title for the Israeli national anthem is Hatikva, the hope. The hope. There has always been hope among the Hebrew people. There's always been expectations among the Hebrew people. There's always been, always been trust between the Hebrew people and God. And he shows it over and over and over again. And he tells them over and over and over again. It's because you forgot your trust in me. That I'm doing this. But at every point. In every time. You know. when It's like Abraham always said. If there's just one righteous person. If there's just one. And God says you know. I remember that Abraham. That's why I remember my promise to you. And I will do what I can to keep my promise. That's why there's so much trust. Even when it seems like everything is is going wrong. When it seems like all hope is gone. You know, it's like. Can we still trust? Yes, you can still trust your creator to keep his promises. And what people forget is, yes, God promised to protect you. He promised to to guard you and to keep you. But we forget our part of that bargain. Because our, you know, and it is participatory. You have to choose to participate in this, okay? You can turn around and walk away from it anytime you want as an individual. You can turn around and reject your creator. Because to receive his blessings, to receive his promises, there's some things you need to do. First thing is you have to trust that he's not only going to give the good stuff that he promised to give you if you follow his instructions, but you have to trust him enough That if you turn around and walk away, he will allow things to happen to you that you're probably not going to like. Okay? It's that simple. You won't like the things that he allows to happen to you. It's far better. It's far more exciting when you can look around and say, I recognize that as a blessing from my Creator. And even if you wind up in a position where you have to be put in front of people you don't want to be put in front of, you can trust the Almighty that when you open your mouth, His words 
will come out. They won't be yours. They'll be his. You can trust your creator to guide you and to to correct you. You can trust your creator to keep his promises because that is who he is. It's what he does. You know, in, in today's vernacular, we have, you know, this term in America, I'm all in. That simply means that everything you have is put on the table. And when everything you have is put on the altar, let me say that again. When everything you have is put on the altar, you're all in. And your creator will match that because he's going to be all in too. Because together, there is nothing that you cannot accomplish when you're all in and your creator is all in with you. Sometimes it might seem a little difficult. Sometimes you might wonder, you know, you're, and, and, and to put this in... Um, I don't want to make fun of this, really, because it's serious. But the best way I know to put it is, you know, when you're sitting there and and you're all in and God's all in with you and things are going a little weird sometimes and you look at it, you, you kind of want to look over the hand that you're playing and you're looking at your creator and you're saying, God, are you sure you got the cards to win this? Are you sure... Now, here's something you can take to the bank. He's going to look back at you. He's going to wink. And he's going to say, I got this. Don't you worry. I got this. Don't you worry. We're going to win this one. Guarantee it. You can take that to the bank. And like I say, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like I'm making fun of that because I'm not. But I'm using that example, hopefully, so that you can understand that even when you wonder sometimes, even, you know, it's like, man, you know, I bet the farm on this one. God's going to just look at you and say, I got it. I got the cards. Don't you worry. Sometimes we wonder. And sometimes we get, you know, a little antsy. And we start looking. Are, are you sure? Are you sure? You can be certain. Guaranteed. You know, it might not go your way, but it's going to go God's way, guaranteed, every time. Hope is, you know, it's a nice concept, it's a Greek concept, but think about it this way. Would you rather hope you get something, or would you rather expect and trust your creator, to give you the things he chooses to give you. And all you have to do, all you have to do, is live the way you're designed to live. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I trust that you have uh, learned a little something about hope and trust and expectation. When we can tie things together and we can bind our trust and our expectations that the Almighty will give us the things He chooses to give us, that is when we put our faith in action. Until next time, have a wonderful, wonderful week.